I'm going to give you a very basic introduction to the idea of electrical circuits. And I'm hoping that at this stage, you already have an understanding of the term voltage, which is the amount of energy per unit charge. We're gonna also introduce the concept of current and also resistance. And in essence, we're gonna cover a little bit of what you covered in year nine and 10. So let's start off by introducing two very simplified models of understanding electrical circuits, a water analogy and a slide analogy that I developed. Let's start off first, first with these two beakers and they have different amounts of water. You could say there's more potential energy because there is a higher, a level amount of water here, and this has a lower potential energy. If I were to connect the two up, water will flow from left to right. Why is that the case? Well, we have a higher amount of pressure, so to speak. Water will flow from left to right. We get an, a current. Why? Because we have a higher amount of potential energy, and if we divide it by the amount of water, we have a higher amount of potential, and so we have a potential difference between these two, and as a result, the water is going to flow. If I have more water here, then obviously the, I'm going to have an increased flow of water as a result. But of course, this will stop eventually because eventually they will level out and so we'll have no flow. So what do we do to fix that problem? Well, what if we could collect the water that is going into the smaller beaker and able to transfer that across to the larger beaker so that we have a complete loop? But you say, but that's a problem because now what we're going to do is we're going to somehow raise the water down the bottom and raise it up into the next one. We need to find some ways of pumping that water up. And so we need to include a pump. And then that of course will work. The pumping of the water, we will therefore keep the level of the water in the left beaker high, water will continue to flow across to the low beaker. And as a result, the current of water will might drive this paddle wheel around and therefore converting the energy of the water into other forms of energy, in this case, causing a paddle wheel to turn. But we need to comply, supply energy to the water to pump it up to the top level again. So what we have here is the term of a source. We have a source of energy and we have here a load where the energy is converted into other forms. So that's often called the water pump analogy for an, a simple circuit. And of course, this will stop working if I were to cut the pipe anywhere along this particular loop. Now here's another analogy that I use. Similarly speaking, we have a source. In other words, you need to drive energy. In this case, people are going to go to the top of the staircase, and as a result, they're going to increase their potential energy. If we divide them by their mass, we increase their potential. It's the amount of energy per unit bit, so to speak. And so now they have the ability to do work by sliding down the slide and heating the slide up as it goes along. The energy is converted that they have into other forms of energy, in this case, heat energy. What will determine how fast that they'll move through this loop? Well, that's determined really by two things. Number one, it's determined by how high my ladder is or how high how my water slide is. And it's also determined by the slope. In other words, the, the slope of this slide over here. And so if this slide is really nicely slippery and really long, that's going to be having a different rate of people going through here than if I were to make this really steep and narrow and let's say really gritty with sand and that's gonna slow them down a significant great deal. You'll notice I have two people here. I have Victor and I have Amy. Victor is akin to measuring the voltage. That is the rise or supply of energy to the system. And th that's analogous to the idea of energy, the height of the ladder. Amy over here measures the rate at which people pass her. Amy is actually like measuring the current. So now let's draw a very simplified electrical circuit that shows those components, whether it's the water or the slide analogy. So here I have a supply. So this thing here, which is referred to as our voltage supply or our what we call our voltage source is akin to my ladder here. And of course, in this case, this is a simple for the battery or the cell. And this supplies our energy per unit charge. Over on the other side, we have our resistance. Our resistance is where the energy that is supplied to our particles, in this case, our electrons, 
and that means it's converting energy into other forms. So our slide is our resistor over here like that. Now you can see I have an ammeter and a voltmeter. You can see they're slightly connected differently. So our ammeter is placed in the circuit. So like Amy is part of the circuit and the voltmeter measures the difference between the top and the bottom. You'll note that I can move this on this side over here. The voltage here will be measured and the voltage here could be measured and we're gonna get exactly the same value just in opposite sign. What does that mean? Well, obviously the gain in energy per unit charge is gonna be equal to the loss or transformation of energy per unit charge on the other side. And that is obviously makes sense. If you have a ladder, you go to the top, you're gonna to drop the same amount that you were raised in the beginning. So that gives you an essence of a simple circuit. Let's remind ourselves too of what a simple circuit does and why it works. Now here I have a positive plate and a negative plate and I have these arrows which represents the electric field lines between the positive plate and the negative plate. All I'm doing here by adding this block is actually finding a conduit for electrons or charges to flow. And so I have, as a result, the ability that if I apply an electric field, our current will flow as long as I allow a conductor to allow that current to flow. So here is our simple circuit again. You'll see over here is my source and here is my load. And as a result, I am going to be able to set up with this plate an electric field, which means I will have a flow of charge because charge will flow or experience a force in an electric field. Now, in this case, you can see my field is clearly drawn with arrows going from the red to the black, and that is the direction of positive charge. So this is the direction of a positive charge and referred to this as our conventional current. But we know in reality now that the electrons are the ones that are actually flowing and they're flowing in the opposite direction. So this is called the electron flow. So note that the conventional current is in one direction the electron flows in the other direction. That's a historical anachronism. In other words, we know now that electrons are actually doing the flowing through an electrical circuit, but in the 1800s, the view was that the positive charge was the thing that was flowing in electrical circuits. And so we have this idea of conventional currents. So we keep the convention, even though we know that the electron flow is in the opposite direction. So the electron flow is always from the black to the red or the negative plate to the red plate, but the conventional current is in the opposite direction. Before we talk about resistance and current specifically, let's remind ourselves of how we classify materials based on their conductivity. Now, generally speaking, we divide them into two groups. They are conductors and insulators. Conductors is where you have electrical charges that are relatively free to move. Do you notice I mentioned the word relatively free? In other words, they're not completely free because actual fact, we also have materials called superconductors where the charges are free to move. Now we have insulators as something which does not conduct electricity very well. They are basically charges that have no charges ability to move. But again, that's a loose grouping. What do I mean by that? Well, so you can see here types of materials and the materials aren't just simply good conductors or bad conductors or good insulators. They have a range of conductivity ability. So you can see with metals, the ability to conduct actually varies. And I'll talk about this term resistivity in a moment. But in essence, what that means is some metals are better conductors than others. Gold is better than steel, for example. When we look at, let's say, wood, consider as insulators, you can see there's a range of abilities abilities of insulation. So ceramics have a really high resistivity. In other words, they are very resistant uh, to electrical flow, but again, different materials have different uh, properties. And so this is a term called the resistivity, which I'll talk about next. So in essence, when we talk about a substance resistance, that is the ability to slow the flow down. So like our water analogy, that is like the thickness of the pipe or the diameter of the pipe. Like our slide analogy, it's about the surface of the slide itself. It's actually determined basically by a number of factors. So the ability to slow the electron flow, the ability to cause those electrons to 
actually lose their energy into other forms of energy is determined by four things. It's determined by the substance, the thickness, the length, and the temperature. And in essence, the resistance ends up being a multiplication of resistivity, the length, and inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area. Let me explain this with some simple uh, analogies. Let's talk about resistivity first, which is related to this. What's the material made out of? That determines the actual value of the resistance. Obviously, gold is better than, let's say, iron, for example. The second is the length. In other words, the amount of material that you have that the current has to flow through can determine its resistance. For example, you have a speaker connected to your stereo. Is your speaker wire 15 meters long or only one meter long? Now, that material may be copper, it may be something else, but the length itself is a factor of its ability to slow the electron flow down. A shorter wire will have a lower resistance than a longer wire if everything else is the same. The other one is the cross-sectional area. A fat wire, a thick wire, electrical wire is going to be able to be more conductive than let's say a thin wire. And so for example, your household circuitry in your house is made up of copper, so that's the resistivity. They'll use the shortest amount of wire that they need to use, that's the length, but they'll use thicker gauge wire because it can conduct greater amount of electricity because it's simply thicker. And then there finally is the concept of temperature. Temperature in itself can actually change the resistance of a wire. A hot wire, where the atoms are vibrating more violently, more vigorously, they're going to slow electron flow more and therefore also contribute to the resistance, which actually is a double-edged sword. So in other words, if a current starts to flow through a wire and starts to heat the wire up because there is some resistance already, the fact that it's increasing in temperature actually increases its resistance. And that will be a factor we'll look at later, which where we talk about ohmic and non-ohmic uh, resistors. That essence, it's the, it determines the amount of electrons that will flow under a certain electrical pressure. The amount of electrons flow, as we're going to learn, that is talking about the current, and a certain electrical pressure that is really talking about the voltage. And ultimately, it's measured in a term called ohms. Now let's talk about current. That is the rate of flow of charge. Mathematically speaking, it's actually the charge value divided by the time. Now we, the unit for charge is coulomb and the unit for time is second. So the current is basically the number of coulombs per second. So one coulomb per second is equivalent to, to one ampere. If we put that all together, we get this simplified diagram over here. And ultimately, the amount of current flowing through a circuit is determined by two properties. What's the electrical pressure? What's the voltage applied? What's the potential difference? And also the resistance. In other words, the resistance, if you increase the resistance, you're gonna slow the rate of flow. If you're increasing the voltage, you're gonna increase the rate of flow. And the two determine the amount of current. So that's a summary quickly of voltage, current, and resistance. I hope that has helped you.